This is David Gowan Parisi, and I'm here with the author Trung Li Nguyen, the author of The Magic Fish. It's an awesome graphic novel. I'm here actually at my campus. I'm a middle school teacher I'm with my students here um, at Zachary Middle School. So shout out to all of our people at Zachary. Guys, give a shout out for Zachary. Say like, ooh, yeah. yeah <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, they've come up with a lot of good questions to ask you, Trunk. And mm -hmm. sure. uh, we're really excited to talk with you and to get to like, um, just get to like talk with you. It's super exciting. Welcome. How is it going? Good. Things are pretty good. I'm just I'm I'm getting back into Zoom mode and having meetings, and so I'm I'm all excited and caffeinated and ready to be here. <laughs> nice. So where are you at right now? Like, are you? I know that you're based in Minnesota, but is that where you're at right now? Yes. Yeah. I am in Minneapolis. I am sitting in my office. I am looking out my window on a beautiful rainy day at my chickens, trying to figure out their new water feeder situation. <laughs> awesome. Um, so <clears throat> as I said before, um, just a real quick intro about, um, the magic fish. It's an awesome graphic novel for, uh, it's really good for all ages, but especially good for teens and younger readers, but adults also, um, love this book, but my wife can attest. And <laughs> it's a mixture of realistic fiction and fantasy and fairy tales also includes a lot of coming of age and like what my students were talking about just earlier shout out to jose a lot of times like the stuff in fairy tales doesn't make sense with how the stories are being told but then those weird conditions that fairy tales have somehow have a way of like finally getting themselves together and resolving in their weird fairy tale magical way so it's a really phenomenal book it has some really powerful stories about being a refugee, being an immigrant, about learning different languages, um, especially coming from Vietnam. The mom's character is a Vietnamese immigrant and her son, Tien, is the main character on the cover here. And their stories are interwoven with various types of fairy tales. They're really awesome. It's, it's just an awesome book, an awesome comic and graphic novel. So that's a brief intro for the book. Well, thank you for that. That was lovely. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, I have some questions from my students just to try to like kick stuff off and, and get us talking okay. and discussing stuff. So my student, Sally, has a question that says, why, do you why did you decide to write this book in comic form? Well, um, I think my main consideration is that I consider myself to be a visual storyteller. I've always loved comic books because they access different parts of literacy that we don't really think of. I think oftentimes when we think about comic books, even the best intentioned people who advocate for comic books will kind of say that comics are for reluctant readers or they're kind of a transitional kind of form of literature when it's really its own thing because everyone sort of lives in or who has access to like kind of a visual culture develops a visual vocabulary and you learn to pick up and read symbols in a way that is not always present in a text only book. Um, and there are things that we often learn like kind of as small children and comic books often get conflated with illustrated books. Um, and uh, they, uh, it sort of evolves as we get a little bit older. The things that we kind of see in our day-to-day -day lives and in our media informs the way that we read images when we read comic books. And so I wanted to tell the story in a comic book format because there are some things that you can only do in a comic book that I find to be really special. So that was my ideal way to tell the story. Awesome. Sorry, we were talking about dubstep earlier. I'm so sorry about that. Trying to get the sound to go louder in my classroom so my students can hear it better. So how long have you wanted to make stuff in comic form? Like, when did you start getting interested in making comics? Uh, this is actually kind of relatively new to me. I have always kind of made comics very informally in my own free time. I'd never considered that it was going to be something that I could do for a job. 
Um, but it was a mode of communication that I always found to be really accessible. And whenever I had, you know, a problem or if I wanted to express something or if I needed to work out an idea in my head, I would usually, you know, draw something and put text next to it and sort of storyboard. And so I've always drawn comics to a, a, a degree. Um, and then it wasn't until after I graduated from college that I started to make comics and tell stories with some intention and putting it on the internet for other people to see. So this has been, you know, within the past decade, I've started making, I've been doing comics for a little bit. Um, and this is my first solo kind of long form project. Okay, awesome. Um... So along those lines of like making comics, I know that, um, let's see. Let me go to one of my other questions that they have. About like drawing the comic and like the craft of making a comic. My student, Anna, has always wanted to ask a comic artist, how do you find your art style? Because finding an art style is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that finding an art style just takes a lot of practice. One thing that you don't really hear a lot is that art styles are frankly what happens when you take a lot of different shortcuts and then you start to prioritize which parts of an image you like the best. And so you start to kind of um, adjust your drawings in order to make it so that you are making something that you really enjoy. So an art style, I think, is a lot like is a lot like someone's handwriting. Sometimes you can't really help the way that your hand just likes to make marks across a page. Um, and sometimes you start to develop things that kind of catch your eye or makes you feel really good when you put down a mark. And so I really like very like noodly patterns. And so I started to kind of incorporate that and I got better and better at it. So now it's just a part of the way that I like to express myself visually. So, um, and especially with comic books, when you're drawing images so many times over and over and over the same characters and you're drawing different story beats and you're making sure that you know, the environments are, um, you know, are pretty consistent from page to page, you end up translating this sort of um, what you observe in reality in your own kind of unique way, because the drawings are going to be imperfect, but they're going to be readable, which is the important thing. And the ways that your drawing is readable and the ways that you like to do it are going to kind of inform what people start to identify as your style. And I think that's actually kind of really cool. It's not something that, you know, you can build out of thin air. It's very, very personal. And it just depends on what your priorities are. It depends on what you like to do. Um, so art style is not something that I, I worry about. It's something that does take a lot of work, but it's also something that's sort of second nature and that will come to you with practice. Awesome. Um, one of my students in my other class, uh, Jenna, really commented on when you're doing in the comic it changes the colors a lot of times there's different color schemes mm -hmm. and um could you talk about like some of the design choices with like the different color schemes that you used and sure what the absolutely yeah so um i did not go to art school and so i have a very limited understanding of you know color theory and when you're working collaboratively with other people, it's just nice to be upfront about that and say, hey, look, this is how I prefer to work. And so um, my editors were very clever in coming up with, okay, so we can work in a limited palette so that we can print a story in color so that the audience and the readership can get the full experience of reading a story in full color, but also kind of work in a way that suits your style. And since my story sort of jumps around in different story universes and different points in time, um, one of the ways that I think it was my editor, Gina, at the time, who had come up with um, the idea of how to make the, those different story shifting universes more readable. And that was to sort of shift the palette from one stage to another. And so we picked three different colors. And so I chose kind of like a warm uh, yellow brown hue um, to sort of, you know, uh, give you the impression of sepia, which is something that I conflate with the past. Um, and it's also kind of a morning color. So I think, okay, so like earlier in the day, in the morning, it's going to be a little bit more yellow. Um, the warm colors um, that are kind of pink and red are kind of midday colors for me, sort of things that are happening in the present in the story. And they're also kind of where the lifeblood of the story is. It's where the characters live and exist and have feelings. And so I wanted pink to be the present. And then 
I always considered, you know, blues to be sort of a midnight color, and that's the color of bedtime stories, and it's the color of, you know, the night sky, and so I always liked that notion of, you know, these are the colors that I associate with different times of the day, and these are the different universes that happen in the story. Awesome. Um, let's see. So, <clears throat> getting to some of the like inspiration of this book and about um, like the main character, Tian, can you talk a little bit like what inspired the about the main character? Um, this is a question by J Jayana. Who was the main mm -hmm. character inspired by? And then Patrick kind of expanded on that being like, was this a part of your life or your friend's life? Or like, how are you inspired to make these characters? Sure. So this is uh, a book that's certainly a work of fiction, but a lot of the things that happen to the characters are sort of things that I've drawn from in my life. And I've sort of aged down the characters a little bit because some of the things that happened to Tian actually happened to me when I was in high school. <laughs> so I kind of moved things around and sort of kind of adjusted for, you know, the characters' ages and priorities. Um, and so it, it's it was sort of a process of like, okay, what are the things that happened in my life that I found to be really important? And if they happened to another person who was a little bit younger than me, what would that look like? And what would that look like if it happened 10 years earlier than, you know, when they happened to me or like five years earlier? Um, and so it was kind of just sort of taking parts of my life that I knew well and, you know, were, was comfortable being a little bit confessional about and sort of remixing them in ways that could be, you know, novel and exciting. And that would really challenge me to empathize with people kind of outside of my own experience. And so certainly a lot of the events are inspired by things that I've experienced um, and the ways that the characters develop friendships are also things that um, I've sort of fictionalized, but like those were sort of the things that I wanted when I was a kid. Like I wanted really supportive friends and I wanted, you know, parents who like, even if they didn't understand everything that was going on, you know, tr did their very best to sort of meet me where I was. And so a lot of the story is both um, kind of, it comes from semi-autobiographical spaces, but also represents this kind of fantasy of growth and of betterment. Awesome. Getting the full school experience with like announcers of another speaker. Okay, so Landon has a question in the story. What is what does the character mean when can you say, repeat it one more time? Uh, so his dad broke a promise. To, this was the Cinderella story in the beginning of the book. Mm. What what ha, what did you mean like when the dad broke a promise and then the mom went back to the sea, back into the ocean? Can you explain sure. a little bit about so, that? There are a lot of little fairy tale references. So each of the fairy tale stories are not straightforward retellings of different fairy tales. And they kind of broadly are, but that part in the very first story is a reference to um, an Irish fairy tale of the Selkies. Um, and there are, in that story in particular, it, like that Cinderella story has a lot of very dark undertones to it that have sort of been woven in that I've sort of euphemized a little bit, um, not necessarily for the benefit of my audience, but that reference is to a story about a Selkie, um, which is sort of like an, a mermaid that exists kind of like in Irish mythology. And there's a story about a woman like, who, or about a like a seal woman who like comes to a shore and she turns into a woman when she walks around on land. And if a man steals the seal skin that she comes in, then she has to marry him. And one of the um, one of the striking things about the one of the stories of the Selkie for me is that there is a direct and oblique reference to domestic violence. So the story goes that if the man strikes his wife more than three times or three times like she will return to the sea and never come back and so the reference in the story is that there is an abusive household situation happening and so that is the magic of the selkie she gets to leave if it becomes too much for her oh my goodness so did you catch how that was like an abusive situation that's that is so much stuff wrapped into those fairy tales those all those different layers. You're um, that's been the quote of the week from Shrek. Like, there's so many different layers to this. Yes. Um, Onions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow, super fire. That's very cool. 
Okay. Um, another question about like the making of the comic, and then we'll kind of transition into some other questions that my students have. Um, yeah, certainly. How long did it take to illustrate? Yeah, how long did it take to illustrate? Because some of the panels look very detailed. That's from one of my students, St. Mm -hmm. Reina. And how long did it take you to write and draw it? Because it sounds and looks cool from my, my student, oh. Amber. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, so uh, the we budgeted, I think, about a year and a half for me to finish it. And I think it took me a little bit longer to fully flesh out the story. And I think the writing part took me much longer than I thought it was going to. So I'm someone who's much more comfortable drawing. And so scripting things out and making sure that all of the story beats are exactly where I need them to be and that all of the lines of dialogue sound correct, that was a really challenging part for me. So that took a little bit longer. Um, and then I think, yeah, it took me I, probably a full year at least to finish drawing every page. It was quite a long process. Um, drawing graphic novels takes always more time than you think. <laughs> Yeah, so I've heard about comic artists talking about their work and how it's like a grind and they get sometimes they'll get to the point where like I have to do this certain number of pages a day or even this certain number of panels. What was it ever like that for you when you were um doing this? Yes. Whole book? Yes, absolutely. I had to. So there's a note at the beginning of the book that I drew most of the pages traditionally and then I had to switch over to a digital format. Um, and I did that so that I could hit my deadlines more consistently because I used to draw on just office paper with pens and pencils and then I would clean it up and then I would scan it and then I would format and then I would send it to my editors. And that really adds up when you're drawing, <laughs> you know, hundreds of pages. So I, it was nice to, you know, I had to learn a new skill so that I could just finish a page and then have it be done and send it right on to my editors. Um, so yeah, there's there's quite a lot that goes into that process and making sure that I you know hit my deadlines and make sure that everything is you know that all of my ducks are in a row. That's awesome. Okay. Um, one other question about the characters um, is making the characters fun. And that's from one of my students named DJ, like designing the different characters and making the characters like what is that process like? Yeah, making the characters was a lot of fun for me. Um, I got to, uh, you know, I got to draw the characters. I usually go visually first and so I'll draw the characters and then I'll suss out their personalities as I'm, you know, writing. And so I'll write and then I'll like do little doodles of the characters so that I have a point of reference for what they look like on the page. And then as their personalities start to come forward, I make a little bit of make little adjustments to things like what they wear or like what goes in their rooms um, and the things that they do later on or how they say certain lines. So it's kind of this ongoing process of negotiating, you know, what you thought this character was when you first wrote about them or when you first drew them and then who the character eventually introduces themselves to you as. Um, and so I loved making the characters. I really enjoyed, you know, you know, drawing little doodles of original characters and then seeing them interact with each other and then changing in front of me. That was always really cool to, to see. Nice. I have to, I have a question too to kind of expand on that. My students and I were all like into fashion. We're constantly talking about like people's fits and like their different looks and stuff. <laughs> and like the character in your um, comic, they have really good fits. I mean, from Tian having that patchwork coat to the detail of like the fairy tale characters. So I was wondering if you could talk about like fashion and like any kind of stuff. Like, is that something that influences you? Because the the drip of the characters is yes. really Absolutely. I love talking about, you know, the characters clothes. And so I it was one of the things that I had to work the hardest to make sure that I got things right. Um, and so everything was very intentional when I you know tried to figure out what the characters were wearing. So we're going to start in the present. So all of the kind of red and pink portions of the story. Um, those. Uh, so since the story takes place in the mid 90s, um, all of those characters uh, are kind of like their clothes are based off of old family photos that I had. And so I dug them up and then I referenced a lot of the photos 
um, and the clothes that, you know, my parents wore or, you know, my uncles and aunts and kind of like old kids clothes that I had. And so when I first immigrated to the U.S. when I was very little, I had a lot of clothes like from Goodwill. And so I had a lot of hand-me-downs, I think, from the late 80s to the early 90s. And so that's kind of why all of their clothes look like that. And um, Helen's clothes are actually direct references to clothes that my mother used to wear. Like she liked to wear pants and she liked to wear like certain jackets and big sweaters. And so you know, your clothes can tell you a lot about like where a person is in their life at the moment. And so it's sort of a comment on class. Like, you know, if your clothes don't fit super well, um, you know, it's a labor of love to make sure that you make clothes that your relatives or like your loved ones can wear and like look really good in and feel really nice in. But also the clothes that you're, you know, walking around in kind of tells you a little bit about where you're coming from and where your priorities are. Um, and so there's, you know, a pretty stark contrast between like the uniforms that Tian gets to wear to go to school and like Helen's clothes when she's sort of like going about her day and just sort of working. Um, he's sort of a smaller character and he doesn't have a huge role in the book, but um, Tian's dad is also modeled after a lot of the clothes that my dad used to wear. So he has like a corduroy jacket that he puts on before he takes the bus to go to work. And that was something that I was always really fond of when I was when I would think about, you know, my family and how, I, how what things looked like when I was growing up. Um, and so the present is just based off of old family memories, old family photos from the 90s. So that was really fun. Um, the past, I had to do a lot of visual research on what went into um, clothes in Vietnam in the 1940s and 50s. And so if you do a lot of research on Vietnam, a lot of the visual references you get are of the war. And so you get people kind of in the 60s and 70s and what clothes looked like then. Um, and that's not very representative of what the nation looks like and what people wore kind of on a day to day basis. And so going back a little bit further, I had to dig into Vietnamese archives about, you know, like photographic archives of like what people thought were fashionable and, you know, what rich people wore versus like what regular everyday people wore and what the political implications of those things are. I wound up doing a lot of research on the history of the dress that the Cinderella character in the middle fairy tale wears. Um, uh, and so she wears something called an ao yai, which is the Vietnamese national garment. And that has a very long history of kind of being filtered through the lens of it started off as kind of like this unisex court dress, I believe, um, that both kind of like um, the indigenous people wore and then also Chinese people started to kind of wear and appropriate that clothing when they kind of moved in. And so that garment has a history of um, kind of embodying different points of occupation. The garment is much tighter now than it used to be because when France colonized Vietnam, there were a lot of aesthetic things that were picked up on in the arts um, in terms of Vietnamese people as well. And so there is this sort of sentiment of like, okay, so the dress has to be cinched in a particular way and it has to fit in a particular way. And that has a lot to do with French fashion ateliers in the 1930s affecting the ways that um, Vietnamese artisans approached their work in making clothes. Uh, through the 30s and 40s as well. And so I had to think about all of those things and what the visual imagination of a storyteller of someone who grew up in Vietnam in the 1940s and 50s looked like. And so that was really fun. Um, and then the fairy tales, uh, the very first story, I did a lot of dresses from kind of the 1950s after the Second World War because there were austerity measures during the wars that kind of restricted the use of fabric. And so after the wars, you could use tons of fabric again and that's when dresses got really huge and really elaborate and that's kind of where we think of like the princess dresses that disney princesses wear in their movies the like a lot of those um princesses like uh cinderella and sleeping beauty like those kind of iconic ones kind of come out of the 1950s and that was when Givenchy came out with a lot of really e extravagant gowns that um you could see in movies like sabrina with Aubrey, audrey hepburn so it's just kind of picking up on all of those very specific like clothing references and seeing their spaces in history and positioning them in an intentional way was loads of fun in terms of making all of the costuming so that was those are all of the different spaces that the clothes come from i hope that answered your question but like i, I had a lot of thoughts about making the clothes and making sure they were right in the book that is so so cool about all those different aspects um that you researched and like all those different levels of it. Um, how do you even like research clothing from Vietnam in the like from the war, then after the war? Like, what do you? How do you even get to that? Like, are there stacks of magazines you could get to, or how, how did you research it? 
So one of the things that you can do, um, one of the things that I wound up doing was going to the public library and asking a librarian to like kind of help me look through old magazine archives. And nice. they're really wonderful at doing those things. Like searching for things on the internet is really difficult if you don't know specific keywords. And so you start having to like type around and then you put in whatever in the search bar and then you look up and you find something that's kind of close. And then you look at all of the other words that are around it and you go, okay, maybe these words will help me get closer to what exactly it is that I'm looking for. And so I end up, I wound up kind of looking at a lot of, like I think I really lucked out because there were a couple of people who kept personal archives um, in public forums of like very old magazine clippings from Vietnam that I could like kind of cherry pick and like figure out where those clothes came from. And then I could look a little bit further into kind of fashion history and what was going on at the time in France and then seeing if that has any correlation. And so it was just a lot of cobbling things together and kind of doing a little bit of a patchwork job. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that like my clothing is accurate, but I think there's sentiments that are really broadly applicable to like a period that people, you know, would be able to use their popular imagination and go, okay, yeah, like this has a, this exists in a space that I, you know, don't really know that maybe comes from this space in this particular time. So it was, it was a very complicated process, but it was just, it was so much fun and really enlivening. And I think it gave this the kind of specificity of each of the stories a little bit more texture that i really appreciated yeah that's yeah it's so intricate and so interwoven in all those different layers that's super fire wow um okay i have another question shifting gears a mm -hmm. little bit it's another question from my student um her nickname is ami and mm -hmm. asked how hard is it to be an asian author and how was your experience different from a white author? Just right to like the sure. hard hitting issue. Yes, yes, this is a very important question. Oh man, well, I just have to say before this that like your students have asked me some of the best questions I've ever received. Like I've been doing <laughs> panels for a long time and the question, like the specific question, even about the line uh, uh, from the first fairy tale, I was thinking about that and I was like, I take that for granted because I know where that fairy tale comes from. But for a student to pick up on that and be like, this is significant for some reason, I need to know about this. I've never answered that question for an adult before. So this is amazing and your students are brilliant and I need you to know that. <laughs> okay, so now on to Omni's question. Um, <laughs> For me, I actually feel a little bit spoiled because comic books have changed so much over the past decade. So the majority, I believe, like something like 52% of like all comic books are sort of geared towards children. Those are the bulk of the sales. And I've never been someone who considers himself to be uh, like a comic book person. Like I didn't think that I was going to get into comic books because I like I found superheroes to be kind of alienating like I grew up like reading kind of comic books a little bit in the 90s and I was like this stuff really isn't for me these fantasies don't really speak to me I'm not really a power hungry person I don't really have like you know revenge fantasies or anything like that and so a lot of those like just didn't really speak to me and so I um, just kind of assumed that I wasn't going to be doing this sort of work but kind of over the last decade, there were a lot of folks who were very intentional about putting together anthologies and gathering Asian American talent and making sure that our voices were heard. And so about a decade ago, there was uh, an anthology called Secret Identities that was put together by um, kind of a lot of Asian authors and um, like writers and comic book people. Um, and so that sort of got a lot of Asian talent on the map. And now a lot of those folks are sort of working for companies that we recognize. Um, I have a lot of colleagues who you know work at DC and work at Marvel and they do work that's very different from me um, but they're able to kind of like advocate for themselves and find a spot for themselves and I think because of the ways that we interface on the internet now there's kind of this colloquializing or it kind of brings down the um, sort of rarefied and inaccessible portions of comic books into a space where we can like really relate and talk to each other um, and so, so there's really been a concerted effort in recent years that I've really benefited from, from people who are both intentionally building communities and also from editors and from leaders um, in positions of power who, you know, would be considered gatekeepers who have a really um, kind of positive and intentional attitude about making sure that marginalized voices are heard. And so I personally have not 
had a lot of trouble as an Asian author because a lot of the work had been done before me. I'd seen people who were just a couple of years ahead of me professionally have to struggle with, okay, so I'm the only Asian American person in the room and people are expecting me to tell these particular kinds of stories when I want to tell other things. And so I've, all, I've seen that dialogue kind of unfold and just because I didn't have to go through it personally, I have to appreciate all of the work that kind of went into it into it before. And I'm sure that there will still be things that kind of pop up. There have been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of kind of violence and anti-Asian violence recently as well. And so there's a sort of pressure that sometimes we feel if we create from a space of marginalization to represent or to edify or to educate or to do something that will benefit the greater good. Um, and honestly, I'm in a space where I can sort of tell the stories that I want to, and I can sort of just exist and demand people's empathy as opposed to their curiosity. So I, I'm very lucky, like as an Asian American artist, to have worked with a lot of really fantastic collaborators who are very understanding. So, so the TLDR there is that, you know, like I have not had a lot of struggles personally, but I've seen a lot of people struggle around me and they've really helped me get to a, a space where I can have a comfortable, you know, working relationship with my work and with my identities. So important because, I mean, some other stuff that my classes were talking about were things about like, well, what is it like to learn a different language? And what is it like to um, translate for people? And that's something that's so important for people to see in all these different um, forms that there is a struggle with people who are um, non-English speakers and there's the struggle of people who are like culture, like changing cultures and fitting in and mixing stuff together. It's like, it's just so powerful to have that. And it gets people thinking right away, like, oh, what are, what are, what are, what are these other people going through that I'm not, that I don't know? It's mm -hmm. really cool. Um, okay. Uh, Another question about like the industry or about like stuff like that. Uh, my student Caleb asked, how hard was it trying to climb up into the ranks as a comics illustrator? <laughs> and you sort of, sort of answered it. But is there anything else that you could add about like people who are um, like working their way up to making a graphic novel or, or even just like people who are interested in doing work that's like this? Okay, yeah, so that seems like a pretty standard like industry like entry question. Yeah. Um, so, so I can speak from my own experience, um, but I don't know how useful this information will be like right now because, you know, it, a lot has changed, like I said, over the last decade. And so I think like really the reason why my work kind of um, got people's attention is because it looks unique. Like I have a very particular point of view. I you know, grew up reading a lot of fairy stories myself. And so I have a, a lot of sentiments about, you know, fairy tale imagery and iconography of early 20th century children's storybook illustrations. Um, and so I have that in my brain and I was very like, this is how I work and I'm not going to draw comics for, you know, for people who want me to work differently. And so I think I sort of lucked out in that, you know, people found that the ways that I tell stories, my handwriting, the ways that I like to draw pictures, was appropriate for certain projects. And so I, you know, I got picked for projects that ed editors thought that I was really right for. And so I got to thrive in spaces where I got to play with my own styles and I didn't have to pretend to be someone else's um, style. And some artists are really good at working in those modes. Artists who, you know, have to draw with a certain level of consistency and a certain level of um, uh, kind of uh, in a sort of a chameleon style to work within the house style of like DC comics or Marvel comics or superhero comics. Like those people are very talented draftspersons and they can sort of um, kind of ape different people's styles when it's appropriate because they have a very broad tool set. Um, and my tool set is very specific. And I think in my case, it helped me um, tell my own stories and, you know, have access to spaces or at least catch the attention of people who would allow me to have space to tell my own stories. Um, 
Yeah, and so my my kind of path to professionalism within comics is very unusual. Like I I started making comics because I lost an internship one summer because the government shut down and I worked at, you know, a government institution at the time. So it was a lot of just it was a lot a series of happy accidents. But I think the number one thing is that I work pretty consistently. Um I share my work in spaces that are accessible and um I kind of I really like to, you know, um connect with other people and share work that doesn't really look like mine. Um, some of the best advice that I've ever gotten about comics and about like books in general is that you, you kind of want to make friends with your peers, make friends with people who are kind of coming up alongside you so that you can sort of lift each other up as you all get further along in your careers. That's awesome. Um, so lifting up your peers and, um, yeah, having your, like, your, your, like, people with you that you can, like, um, connect with. Uh, that's super cool. Um, what about, like, I mean, YA books and, and team books, they're known right now for being so diverse and including so many people. But I still feel like it's such an important thing to talk about. Like, the, the character Tien, he comes out as LGBTQ in a story, and that's just like a huge part of it too. Like, what do you think of, um, what, what is the importance of like telling these stories and then also mixing it with the fairy tales that you mix in your stories, in your work? Sure, yeah. And so, so my philosophy about the magic fish is that stories, you know, change. Like the same stories kind of change depending on where they find themselves, you know, in a certain space and time or someplace in the world. A lot of different fairy tales kind of have different iterations depending on, you know, where you find them anywhere in the world. And they kind of do that, I like to my mind, in order to subsist and to survive. Um, and so that a lot of people have a lot of similar stories that are sort of dressed differently is something that I've always sort of appreciated. Like I, I'm not an author who values novelty over good storytelling. I'm not an author who like really values things to be new and exciting every time. Sometimes I just like collected and really well told, even if it's a story that I've heard. And that would strikes. Oh, they cut out a little bit. Are for you... immigrants and for LGBTQIA people, like those, yeah. Oh, sorry. It, it, um, I, I was cutting out on my end for just a little bit. I think it might have just been for me, though. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Oh, I'm sure. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think telling those stories are kind of really important because there are there's this notion of like you know other writers will talk about windows and mirrors and that readers sometimes like to have a glimpse into an experience outside of their own, but every once in a while, it's really empowering to see yourself in a particular space. I'm not someone who tends to write stories for my younger self. Like, I don't put stories out where I'm like, oh, like, I wish I had this story as a kid. And I know a lot of authors do that, and I think that's really wonderful and empowering, but I've always been more of a Windows person. I like to look into someone else's imagination and see what their space looks like, and I think that's a really lovely experience. But for LGBTQ people, they don't tend to get to be the windows oftentimes. We don't often have opportunities to, you know, to ask people to like look into our lives and look into our sense of interiority. Um, and uh, being able to do that is so enriching culturally, like just very broadly, because it demands empathy of people um in ways that have never really been demanded before and i think that's really important from like a reader's perspective but from an author's perspective just to be able to be in a room and to thrive in an industry is a whole other thing unto itself and so it's it's important on many different levels awesome so so super cool um i know we're getting close to the end of time and i don't want to forget to ask if other people have questions um, if anyone wants to, if anyone has any questions or if any have come through into the chat, I don't know if there are any, but I just sure. want to have there that. Are, I'm noticing a couple of questions coming in through the chat. Let's see, from Max B, as an LGBTQ plus person myself, I connected with this story so much and I'm both incredibly grateful and awestruck that it actually exists. Oh, thank you so much, Max. Um, let's see. 
my question would be what some of your major inspirations were in creating the magic fish. So uh, the students brilliantly touched on all of these things already, but um, I think I can reiterate in that, like, I love fairy tales. I love turn of the century children's books specifically. Um, those kind of come out of a specific space where there's a, there was a relationship between gift books um, wherever the printing press was at the time, like it was still very expensive to print things. And so people made gift books that, you know, kind of were a sign of wealth. They were sort of novelty items. And the illustrations inside were like by Arthur Rackham and like Kai Nielsen, people who, you know, made really beautiful, beautiful, elaborate pieces. And those original pieces would exist in a gallery space alongside the gift books that were being printed as well. And people used to make like, like, you know, they, if you pick up an old book, like the the pages, where there are illustrations, like the illustration is taped on or like glued on with book glue and it's very fragile and very strange texturally. Um, but I loved those books and the imagery that kind of came out of that mode of bookmaking and storytelling. And so that was kind of like a major inspiration that I wasn't able to, um, to elaborate on too much earlier. Uh, let's see if there are other kind of specific questions. I'm getting a lot of very lovely comments. Um, yeah, I think any other kind of like specific story questions. What's that? Can you share anything about like what you're working on next and what some other things are that, that might be? Can you, are you able to share about that? I know sometimes it has to be like kept under wraps, but do you have any yeah. fresh? Yes, uh, so there are some projects that I'm very, very excited to work on. I'm working on my second graphic novel, which is taking so much longer <laughs> than it needs to because uh, this past year has been challenging. COVID has changed everybody's lives. And so my partner got COVID this past year. And so that like a lot of our lives had to shift around quite a bit. So we're, we're in a good place now and I'm starting to be able to like kind of pick things back up, but I've taken on a couple of like smaller jobs in the meantime for DC comics of all places. I'm drawing a short Batwoman comic and I'm doing a really short Green Lantern comic and I'm wrapping those up this week so that I can kind of get back to, you know, working on, you know, this very long form story of, that exists in my heart that I really want on paper. Um, so I have a second graphic novel coming out through Penguin Random House, um, Random House Graphic as well. Um, I have an idea for the title that I don't think that I'm going to reveal to anyone but my editors just yet. Um, but it's based on, um, but it's a romantic comedy kind of based on, the story of East of the Sun and West of the Moon, which is a, an iteration of um, Beauty and the Beast and the, the tale of Cupid and Psyche. So that's going to be a super fun book. And it's going to take place in contemporary times, too. So it'll just be I, it, like I really just wanted to, to tell a story that was fun and not super research heavy. And I'm already starting to <laughs> dive into a research hole. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. That's awesome. So cool talking with you. Um, I'm not sure how to wrap it up, but I loved hearing about all of the different aspects you put into your work. It's so wonderful and so rich, and I'm just so thankful to get to like talk with you and share out all these amazing ideas and hear from you and yeah, my students bounce off ideas too. Yeah. It's really cool. Thank you yes, so thank much. you so so much for for uh, for moderating. Thank you so much for your um, to your students in particular for their questions. They they've asked some of the most brilliant questions I've ever received on a panel, and I got to talk about some things that I was really excited to talk about that I've never been asked before on a panel. <laughs> so th this has just been a, an absolute delight. Thank you to your entire classroom. Thank you to you. I ha I've had a lovely conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, have a good one, you guys. I'm gonna stop the broadcast, um, I think, for the next thing, so bye. Bye, everybody.